and welcome to the Spectrum Show. Coming up, we get all the news and top selling games from April 1989. Matt takes a look at something that makes the Spectrum special. I play some games, have a chat to Jeff, and end with a magazine. But first, it's the news. A new idea has appeared aimed at helping players choose their next purchase. Called Action Screenplay, it's a videotape containing game footage and cheesy introductions. In effect, they are adverts that you have to pay for. The video will be updated every two months and will cost $6.95. That means you have to pay out each time you want to see clips of new games. Many magazines were putting cover tapes out at this point too, so the idea seems to be based on the trailers often found on video films but at least you've got to watch the film with that, whereas this is useless once you've seen it. Taking a leaf from the CRL book of releasing games based on horror films, Ocean's next license will be Nightbreed. The film will be released shortly to the horror-loving public, and the game is said to be based very closely on the movie itself. Let's hope they don't have the same issues around certification like CRL did. It seems that Ocean are busy. Not only are they working on Nightbreed, but also they have their eyes on the Christmas market already. They're looking to take the top spot in the charts this year, and to make sure, they're planning on releasing two blockbusters. The first will be a conversion of the arcade hit Chase HQ, and the second will be based on the new Batman film. Both games are sure to be top sellers, but I'm sure other companies are also beginning to plan their Christmas lineups. Many of the top software executives were flown off to Majorca for the Industry Awards event Computer Arena 89. The whole event seemed to involve a lot of drinking, eating, backslapping and award accepting. Several speakers covered issues first like licensed games and piracy, and then at last the awards were handed out. Game of the year went to Operation Wolf, the best software house was Ocean, the best music was Cybernoid, and the best graphics went to R-Type. The awards were not specifically for the Spectrum, but included them, as well as all other computers and consoles. And that was the news, and now onto the top selling games. At number 5 is Double Dragon from Melbourne House. At number 4, Operation Wolf from Ocean Software. At number 3, Emlyn Hughes International Football from Audiogenic. At number 2, Afterburner from Activision. And at number 1, Robocop from Ocean. And that was the news and top selling games from April 1989. What is the Spectrum's greatest asset? Is it the small size or the classic design? The ever-growing software library of over 20,000 titles? No. Its greatest asset is a graphic display limitation that gives every game a distinctive look. That display limitation is most commonly known as Colour Clash. But what is it? Sir Clive's previous machines had been much simpler affairs with monochrome displays. The ZX80 and ZX81 displayed one colour, black symbols on a white background. So when the ZX82, as it was known in early development, was rechristened the Spectrum, the new machine was sold on its greater memory, but also on the possibilities of playing with 16 colours. 16! Programmers couldn't wait to get started and see what kaleidoscopic creations they could come up with. The sky was the limit. However, things weren't that simple. Although there were 16 colours, two of them were black. Worse was to come though. Across a screen of 256 by 192 pixels, only two colours were permitted to exist in any block of 8 by 8 pixels. The first attribute was called ink colour, and the second paper colour. Think of it in terms of foreground and background. If a third colour suddenly found its way into the same place, then one of the colours had to give way, and the results were messy. So why was this done? Let's not forget that the Spectrum was not originally designed as a games machine. Sir Clive originally envisaged a computer that would enter homes and offices and bring computing power to the British public. Two colours per character block was probably thought of as perfectly adequate for most applications, for example for displaying text in an interesting way. 
But the most likely explanation is performance. It simply ran quicker and saved resources by having a two color limit per character block. In 1982, programmers started making games. They wanted to create colorful images and move them around the screen. Many found that the simplest way to avoid color clash was to limit sprites and backgrounds to the 8x8 pixel character blocks. Resulting games looked simplistic compared to what was achieved in subsequent years. Later though, programmers found clever ways to live with the problem, tackle it, and eventually even beat it. It's time to pay tribute to some innovative techniques. Technique 1. Keep the colors away from each other. Keep everything on a black background, keep all graphics away from each other and hope for the best. Sprites got bigger, but playing areas looked a bit sparse. Technique 2. Make your playing area monochrome. This method was essential if a game deployed isometric graphics which moved diagonally. Colour could certainly be used around the playing area to make the display more interesting. Despite a monochrome look, graphics could be highly detailed. Technique 3. Scroll colourful backgrounds in one direction. Smooth scrolling of a colourful playing area could be achieved by restricting the direction of scrolling. In Zynapse, the playing area only moves horizontally, so scenery like this blue and yellow lattice structure here can appear very colourful without colour clash. Executor achieves a similar effect, but this time the scrolling is vertical, and so the features on the walls, like the pipes on the left here, can be colourful and close together. Technique 4. Use simple, blocky graphics. Some games, and they are certainly rare, take the unusual approach of keeping the graphics restricted to just simple colour blocks, but then compensating with speed or psychedelic effects to entertain. This was put to superb use in Splatter. Technique 5. Too much going on. In these examples, there's literally so much happening that any colour clashes are quite hard to spot. Technique 6. Move your sprites in character blocks. Popular in later years, but done earlier to great effect in the excellent Light Force by Gargoyle Games. This technique, more than any other, uses the spectrum's weakness as a strength. Sprites and scenery are moved 8 pixels at a time, resulting in some really fast animation and no colour clash. A really early example is Sinclair's Stop the Express, which still looks good, even compared to later games. Technique 7. Monochrome sprites behind a colourful foreground. Sprites are monochrome, but they routinely disappear behind bits of foreground scenery which are neatly confined to character blocks in straight lines and rich in colour and detail. In Dan Dare, Dan and his enemies run behind the colourful columns and pillars, while in Shadow Skimmer, the player's ship moves beneath the overhead scenery. Technique 8. Surround your sprites with big black shadows. The late great Mike Singleton took the unusual step of surrounding all his characters with a shadow which was up to 8 pixels thick. In this way, characters could walk past each other but there was no colour clash in sight. Technique 9. Foreground sprites assume the background colour. In this method, the background scenery is colourful but the foreground sprites move around almost like they are transparent. This avoids any background colour corruption, but the downside is that foreground sprites do have a habit of sometimes being difficult to spot. Some games, such as Nighttime, gave us the option to change this to our personal preference, either updating the background colour or ignoring it. And Technique 10. Tell Colour Clash that it's not permitted. Some very clever coding here using a rapid display trick to make it look like there are more colours in each 8x8 character block than are actually feasible. This is becoming more common as people use engines like Nirvana to achieve this effect. Initially I was cynical that this really worked, but it does indeed perform as expected on real machines. So what does this all mean? It means that there are some very clever programming achievements out there which are worthy of closer attention. It also means that Spectrum games will always look a bit different from other formats, and in my humble opinion, that's what makes them special. This is Wizard Willy from Cartoon Time, aka Codemasters, released in 1990. This is not, as you might think, another minor Willy game, Instead, it's an arcade adventure platform game. You have to save Fifi the Fairy from the Emperor's Fortress. To do this, you have to jump through multiple screens, across different areas, 
including enchanted forests, stairways and the castle itself. You start off in the forest, and there's some nice parallax scrolling here. The platforms can be walked behind or jumped on as well, and there are many things to collect. However, this is trial and error. Some give you immunity, some give you energy, some give you more lightning to fire, and some, like the spinning orbs, will kill you instantly. The magic eyes are very important. You have to collect all ten of these per level to be able to progress, so make sure you get them. You can see how many is left to collect on the control panel. There are flying monsters to take care of, and you can do this by firing lightning at them. This though can be tricky, as they often appear at the top of the screen and head straight for you. You have limited lightning too, so use it wisely. You can climb the trees from behind to reach higher platforms, or jump using the branches. The levels are fairly short, and after a few attempts I managed to get to the end of level 1, and here there was an end of level boss, which was fairly easy to get rid of, however by this time I had lost a lot of lives in the level and didn't get very far in level 2. To see more of the game I used a poke for infinite energy. Level 2 is much the same game mechanic, and the enemy movement is the same, but just with different graphics. Some of the jumps on this level are quite tricky too, so you have to be careful. The end of level boss again is exactly the same as level 1, so if you do reach this point you should know how to deal with it. Overall it's a nice game with great graphics. The backgrounds are sometimes animated too, and very detailed, and the sprites are well drawn even if you can't tell what some of them are. Scrolling is smooth and it's a good game to play. Sound is a bit limited, with only a few zaps when something happens, and no music when playing at all. But it's a challenging game and certainly worth checking out. This is Xavier, released by PSS in 1984. You are the sole survivor of Saviour, and you have to save your race from extinction. To do this you have to collect DNA segments that for some reason have been left scattered about in a huge underground complex. The complex, as you would expect, is inhabited by nasty things all guarding this DNA. The game boasts 4096 rooms and 256 different enemies, but once you play you'll notice the rooms are almost identical. On to the game then, and it's a maze game, and the main sprite is huge, and this is the main problem. The amount of enemies on screen make it impossible to make much progress, and you have to collect those orbs, because those allow you to open doors. You find yourself rushing around from door to door before enemies have time to materialise. However, if you want to progress, you've still got to grab those orbs as quickly as possible and get out again. The graphics are large as you can see and the main sprite does have a weird walking animation. The other smaller sprites are animated as well and move smoothly enough. The game's only challenge really is to avoid the nasties. You can shoot them, yes, but the space is so limited it can be difficult. One touch from them and you're dead. It could have been better to either have a health counter that decreased each time you hit an enemy rather than the instant death, or, even better still, a smaller main sprite. The sound is limited to just a few effects, and a terrible tune on the intro screen. Control is good, but again, with the space limitations this proves useless, really. This is a frustrating game. You can't make any progress at all, and the rooms all look the same, so there's no real sense of going anywhere. Making the main sprite smaller, as I've mentioned before, would have provided more room to manoeuvre, and would have increased the gameplay no end, but as it is, this is one to avoid.
This is Squidge 2018, released by TARDIS Remix. Anyone who is a fan of the Spectrum, or has been around the Spectrum scene for a while, will know that certain games are totally rubbish, and the top contender is Squidge, originally released by Powerhouse, the budget label for CRL. The game was unplayable, in that it expected the caps lock to be on, so you couldn't even control anything. The sprites were too large, and even with the fixes in place, it was just broken. I toyed with the idea of remaking it many months ago, and even had a basic game engine up and running, but I was beaten to it by TARDIS remakes, and this proves to be a far better game than I was planning. The game is very close to the original release on the C64, which was far better than the Spectrum one, which wasn't too difficult. The idea is to collect six pieces of the Tree of Life, one by one, and return them to the central screen to plant them. You have to collect keys to unlock force fields, and of course avoid the enemies that appear on each screen. You can top up your health by eating fruit as well. The game has some great graphics that really look like the C64 versions, and everything moves really well. Sound is used to good effect with a variety of different things for shooting, collisions and collections. Control is good too, and it's certainly a playable game. Give this one a try. Hello. Hi, Paul. Uh, you do realise you've chosen Bonfire Night to record a Let's Talk. Yeah, I know. So if there are any loud bangs, it isn't one of us being shot. What were we going to talk about? Uh, wasn't it good and bad arcade conversions because we were at Blackpool um, recently? It was. The one I can remember is Berserk, and then I can't remember after that. You did quite well at, at Berserk, actually. You're better than me. I, I did. I got... I can't remember how far I got, but I got through quite a lot of the screens of the kind of magenta -y hard robots. Yeah. No, but Frenzy, the Frenzy on the Spectrum. Oh, by Quicksilver. Yeah, Frenzy on the Spectrum's yeah. um, the my favourite Berserk uh, conversion to the Spectrum. Okay. But it's got the wrong name, it. so it confuses people. Yeah. You also had a go on Enduro Racer with the handlebars. I did. I didn't do very well on that. I did enjoy it, though. But th those handlebars move backwards and forwards. I didn't realise that. I thought they just steered left and right. Uh, they they do that to jump. So you, mm, you yeah. kind of pull back and you do a wheelie and then you hit the like barrier thing and you do a higher jump. The, the Spectrum conversion, that was brilliant. It was. I used to be able to do that in Spectrum conversion. I used to be able to do the wheelie at the right time and jump over all the obstacles, but I, I couldn't on the arcade. I certainly couldn't remember yeah. the finish. From a, from a good conversion to a crap one in pole position. Yeah, actually, you you played pole position, didn't you? Yeah, I had to go in the sit-down cab, which I'd never done before. I played the stand-up one, but never the sit-down cab, and it was quite interesting. It, it wasn't moving like um, the power drift one was. The, the steering wheel does make a huge difference because it's obviously an analog steering wheel, and you just you haven't just got left and right. You played Tempest, didn't you? If I played Tempest, and if if the monitor that monitor had something, it's either a new monitor or it had been really tuned well because it was absolutely br the graphics were so crisp. I know. And the, the, the only downside, there was no audio to it, which was a bit of a shame. I didn't notice that. Mm. It was so noisy, though. Maybe there wasn't, and we just couldn't hear it. The whole thing was noisy. Um, and only looking back at the video did I realise that some of the games we were playing actually did have audio, but the camera picked them picked it up, but I didn't. I mean, Phoenix was a classic example, because I, I actually got the mothership in that, and I, I, when I was playing it and you were filming, I couldn't hear any audio at all, but the camera picked it up. And of course, the the best Phoenix version on the Spectrum was the one by Mega Dodo. It was. I loved that one. Which was a really good... Well, it's probably the only proper conversion because it had all the levels in it. It did. Um, you had a go on Donkey Kong? I did. Not a very good one at all. <laughs> and there was quite a few conversions of that, which I've covered in a past episode. Yeah. Obviously, with uh, the, the best one's probably the official conversion. I liked the ocean one. It gets The first yeah. one? Yeah. It gets a real yeah. slating, but I had that when I was first got my Spectrum. So, so I put a lot of time in playing it, and once you got used to it, it was pretty good. Another game which had a good conversion was Road Blasters, and I had a quick go on that. How did you get on on that? When you started filming, I just lost all, I just lost all my time, so, ah. <laughs> so there's not there's not a lot of film on it. Um, I, I think I did um, I got an extended time once, and then I was on the second part of it, but that was really good. Robocop, you had a go on? I did. 
Um, that was a brilliant conversion. If we're talking about conversions, then Robocop was an absolutely superb conversion. I used to love that. I had a go on Hang On, or Super Hang On. Yeah. Did that have a Spectrum conversion? It did, and it was it was quite good. But I think it's one of the better motorbike racing games. I don't think I ever played um, that. But yeah, it's uh, it's a good conversion. Obviously, you don't get the full music in the background, but yeah, the gameplay's solid. Yeah. You had a decent go on Robotron. I did. There is a. There was a couple of combos. There is a Robotron for the Spectrum, isn't there? There's an um, there's an official release. But I think I think I came to the conclusion that the best one was was Wild West Hero. I've not played that. Ah, well, there you go. You need to have a go on that. Uh, okay, next one, Commando. You had a go on that. I did. Very very badly. <laughs> Well, I got past the first level. Okay. So, I think it wasn't that bad. You, your video was the worst bit I had. I think I died twice really early on. Right. And then... You did. You and did. then I got... I think I got an extra life. I got all the way to the end and through the end and got an extra life. And I got to the gates of the second level as well. I played it a lot, both on the Spectrum and on the arcade, when I was a kid. Yeah. I mean... To be, to be honest, even though I, I hate Elite, I think that was one of their better games. It was. Another onto arcade conversions, Missile Command. Now that was good. Oh, there was a there was a conversion for that for the Spectrum that I really liked. There was quite a few. Yeah. Um, uh, uh, I think every every major publisher have produced a Missile Command clone. Battlezone, there you go. You had a good go on Battlezone. I had an alright game on Battlezone. I liked Rommel's Revenge. Rommel's Revenge was my favourite. Um, but it was, it was all in silence, wasn't it? I, yeah, it was, but then, especially early Spectrum games, before the 1 to 8 came out, you didn't really have good music anyway. Another interesting game was Joust. And uh, there wasn't a particularly good one for the Spectrum until recently when Alan Turvey released a really good version done in AGD. I did a shootout where there was a few odd ones, but there wasn't one that was sort of nearly arcade perfect, where that one is really good, considering it was done with AGD as well. It's brilliant. I mentioned Power Drift. Well, you don't, you don't like Power Drift, do you? No. On the Spectrum. Or do you like it? Is it just the, the whole thing you don't like, or just the Spectrum version? The whole thing I don't like. don't like it. I've only played it two or three times. The Spectrum version, I don't think, is very good. I think you think it is good. but I, I think it's really good, I, yeah. I, th I thought it was dire. <laughs> the missile missile command. missile command conversion for the spectrum that I really like is called missile defense by Arctic Computing. Yeah, that's the one that I chose as the winner in the shooter. Yeah, I completely agree. It's just got the right feel about it as well. Yeah. You can it's a fire and forget feel, whereas the others are a bit sometimes a bit clunky. But that's the only one I think that had nearly the same feel as the arcade, where you had the freedom and everything worked just right. Yeah. So rounding up then, come on, Jeff, how are we going to round this well, up? Well, I think we should say what we think the best Spectrum arcade conversion is. I think it's coming down to, for me, it's probably coming down to a three-way tie between Missile Defense, Robocop, and Bomb Jack. <gasps> You've missed out Enduro Racer in that one. I know I have, even though that, I, I don't like racing games that much. <laughs> well, <laughs> Not on the Spectrum. I think, I think, I think Enduro Racer is probably my favourite for the Spectrum, the best conversion. I'm going to go with 16K. 16K Phoenix, is, for me, is probably the best arcade conversion. People will whinge and say, what about R-Type? But I'm going to stick with Phoenix. But are we talking the worst the worst of the best, if you know what I mean? Yeah, go on then. What's the worst of the best? Oh, God, right. Okay. That's hard. Um, Ooh. The, the game, the, the, best of, the best of the conversions, which is crap. <laughs> I don't think... You know, there has to this be is impossible game. criteria, isn't it? It is. It is. What's what's yeah. the best of the, what's what's the worst of the best of the conversion? Um, <laughs> I don't even know what that means. No, neither do I. This is 3D Painter, released by CDS Microsystems in 1983. I think we all know what to expect here. CDS, though, have given the game a 3D look. Back in the early days, anything labelled 3D was bound to sell just because of the supposed graphics. As you can see, the 3D extends to having a kind of extrusion from the main pathway. It does look different, I suppose, and makes it stand out from other games of this type. You move around in character squares, changing the colour as you go, and there's another chasing man. The 
the non-animated graphics and standard beeper sounds make it look and feel terrible, and the control is sometimes sticky, meaning you can fail to go down a pathway by either overshooting or stopping one square too soon. There are four different levels with different layouts, that is if you can bear playing for that long. Games like this were often found in magazines, but the 3D name made it stand out. A below average game then, even for 1983. to many computer events, dug through the various boxes and found the odd gem or two, but waded through a ton of junk to find it. There's always one thing that appears in these junk boxes over and over again, the Home Computer Course and the follow-up Home Computer Advanced Course magazines, running from 1983 to 84 for the original and then the Advanced Course took over from 84 to 85. I've always shunned away from these Having flicked through a few issues initially, they appeared boring and aimed at the younger audience. However, a fan of the show donated a stack of these and said if I wanted I could just throw them away. Having them for free at least gave me a chance to examine them in more detail, at my leisure, and the content quite surprised me. I may do a longer feature on these marvellous, often shunned publications, but for now I just want to share my enthusiasm for what I've found so far. Yes, there's a lot of dross in these pages, a lot of dross but every now and again you get the gems. Just look at these diagrams, they're brilliant. This one shows the microdrive. This style of drawing and illustration is found in many issues, and here's one that explains a printer. And this one showing a tape player. And this one a trackball. I mean, they're just superb. Photographs too were always of a very high quality, and here's one showing various add-ons for the Spectrum. It wasn't just things about the Spectrum I enjoyed. Now this is one brilliant computer room. And this, this is my favourite at the moment, and this is how the future of computing will look. There's a keypad to enter binary, because all programmers will want these. Discs will shrink to be smaller than the 3 inch currently available. There'll be an infrared mouse, and you'll be able to view everything on a room wide projection system. Is that an iPad down there? Hmm, interesting. CD ROM will replace ROM cartridges. Well, at least they got that bit right. And just look at that wonderful image. Some images, though, are best left alone. But this is the fun of this magazine, you never know what will turn up. Ah, uh, yeah, let's move on. This cover intrigued me. Notice the fake dirt on this man's face, but the real dirt on this man's trainers. Obviously cheap models, and they seem totally oblivious as to what they're supposed to be doing. They don't even seem to really care. I will continue to read these, and I've got about a hundred to go through but I'm enjoying every page turn.